Um, what we're going to do now, we've never done this before. I've never even seen this screen until we got out here. This is where the questions are going to pop up. So this is completely unedited, and only God knows what's coming up on that screen and the guys backstage. Um, so for this sermon, this, we've never done this before, I'm going to ask you to put your hands together. Welcome my wife, Lucretia, to the stage. Would you welcome Lucretia? You're wearing Gamecock colors, baby. Uh. <laughs> Got to make those people in Columbia feel good. So, Columbia. All right, let's go. <laughs> um, who does the cooking and cleaning? Um, actually, this is kind of a good question for a couple of reasons. I actually enjoy cooking. Um, and I do most of the cooking. Um, we do go out a fair amount, and that was like an issue when we first got married that I was used to eating at home growing up, and going out was a very rare thing. Perry was used to going out all the time after his mom passed away with his dad, so we kind of had that discussion of how much are we going to cook and eat at the house and how much are we going to go out to eat, um, and so we kind of found a good balance with that. Now, Perry does cook, and he does a very good job cooking, and when I was in residency, he would cook a fair amount for us. And um, the big deal there is he likes to cook Mexican, and I don't like to eat Mexican. Um, so when that's his specialty, cooking, it makes it kind of hard. Um, uh, so anyway, and then the cleaning, um, it's kind of been a different story. When we got married, we kind of shared those duties, um, and he had things that he didn't like to do that I didn't mind, and then there were things he didn't mind doing that I didn't like to do, so we kind of shared those, and that worked well. And um, and then just recently, we've gotten where we have a little bit of help. I mean, just every two weeks or something, we have somebody to come over and do some cleaning. And that was just because we got to the point where we were spending all our free time, which was very limited, cleaning the house and not actually getting to spend time together. Um, so we still do clean the house. And, you know, when you have a small child, that's a whole other story. Um, and Karis helps to clean, too, sometimes. So. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay, there's a thing right here that is bothering the heck out of me. Guys backstage, I don't know if y'all can do anything, but it's, thank you. Yay. Like, was that bothering anybody else? It was driving me up the flipping wall. I, was, I felt like I was doing something wrong the whole time I'm sitting here. Yeah, um, that was the great answer to that question. Mm. Anything to add? No, I, I, I do cook. Uh, she's an incredible cook, so why compete with that? And then cleaning, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mind cleaning. I mean, I lived by myself for years, and my house was very clean. I'm, so I don't mind cleaning. I'm that a is guy very that, true. I know how to do, I know, I'm a dude that knows how to do laundry. This is how I learned. My dad took me into the laundry room when my mom passed away. He said, here's soap. This is a washer. This is how you use it. And I figured that thing out. <laughs> so, yeah, that's who does it. All right, next question. I have a sexual past, and I'm not proud of, but God has changed me. When is it appropriate to be honest about it with someone I am dating or want to date? You want me to, go, you want me to do this one? You can go first, and okay. I'll add on. If... Okay. Uh, th th great question, by the way, whoever sent this one in. Um, I have a sexual past. Before I was a Christian, um, I did some things that I'm not very proud of and was not a virgin. And it, it was, it, I mean, it, it, was, it was just not good. And so if you're that person in this room, I know exactly, uh, I, know, I know the heart of this question. Uh, the thing not to do on the first date is outline your sexual past with the, I mean, because they, they, like, seriously, they, they, they want their chicken sandwich, all right? They're trying to eat their chicken sandwich. You're like, and I did it with this person, I did it with it. And they're like, oh, so, so that's, I mean, just don't do that. Don't do, don't do that. I, I decided um, after prayer that it was time to discuss my sexual past with Lucretia when I felt like, yes, we're going to get married. Now, you'll meet people that have a different opinion than what I'm about to share with you, and that's fine. They're wrong. Um, but I've heard people say, well, you don't need to tell people about, you don't need to tell the person you're marrying about your sexual past because um, if, 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 if God, you know, God's forgiven you and it's in the past. But see, when, when you marry someone, you marry everything about that person. You get everything about them, including their past. 
And so, they, so the person you're marrying has a right to know. They have a right to know. Because here's the deal. Nobody on the planet can walk up to Lucretia and say, Perry Noble did this, or Perry Noble, did you know this about Perry Noble? And her go, wow, I didn't know that, because I've told her everything. And she knows everything. Um, but I would say you need to discuss that with that person when you really do feel like, wow, we are going to get married. Not, we might get married. Because you, listen, by the time you tell 17 people, no, I mean, that's just weird. So wait until you know that you're going to get married and then have that conversation would be my advice. What do you, what do you think, baby? Oh, I agree. I mean, definitely when you know that's a committed relationship and you're going towards marriage and you need to have that talk. And I mean, and that's going to affect your life together. I mean, that's mm -hmm. going to affect emotions, you know, sexually, you know, just as your relationship. And that needs to be out there. And you need to be honest. Um, and the thing I would add from my point of view is it was really like a God teachable moment for me because, you know, you're like, you know, I hate that. That hurts my heart. I wish that weren't the case, but I love that person so much. And it was just like, you know, God was like, that's how my relationship is with you. You know, you hurt my heart and you mess up, but it doesn't change my love for you. Um, so. Next question. This is my question. Thank you. I am, I'm married a cheeseburger, but want a filet. Now what? <laughs> you want to go first? Yeah. Because you could probably answer this question great. Um, <laughs> to the person that asked this question, I would, I, I would say, here's the first problem with this question. You think you're a filet. Like, like you, you think you're the filet. And so obviously this question is based out of a frustration of the imperfections in your spouse. And I would say b before you judge him, make sure that you have a right relationship with God and your concern for him is out of compassion and not self-righteousness. Now that's just the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is you, you married him. You married him. And so it's not your job to nag him closer to Jesus, but it's your job to be the woman that God called you to be and maybe through your outstanding character as 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 outlines that he will be drawn closer to Jesus. He's not going to be drawn closer to Jesus because you bother him. He's going to be drawn to Jesus because he sees Jesus in you. So that, that would be what I What do you think, baby? Yeah, I mean, you know, God honors that commitment that you made. And, um, you know, Scripture does clearly say to be that woman of God and maybe that through your actions, he, th this guy or girl is going to see Jesus in you and that will draw them to Jesus. And for people who are not married, I would just say take this to heart that, you know, you don't marry someone with the expectation that they're going to change. So if you're not marrying the person as is and you're knowing that's God's best and you're thrilled about that, don't think, oh, things are going to change. So go into that marriage, you know, with the commitment to the person that you're marrying as they are. And then if, you know, whatever happens later, you're still, God still honors that commitment and you still honor that commitment. That's good. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I would write that down and go read that. It's, it's great. And then First Peter chapter, chapter 3, verse 7 is for the men tells us to live with our wives in an understanding way, which if you get that one down, that's, that's good. It tells you to understand your wife. That'll take forever. Exactly. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> How do you deal with finances, especially if you don't agree on something? Columbia. <laughs> hey, Columbia. Is that like football tickets? Football tickets? <laughs> what would you say, baby? Because we, we've had uh, two arguments about money ever, ever. And you were right both times. So, how, honestly, how would you, how would you answer that? Um, as far as how we deal with finances, um, Perry does take care of more of the finances, but I'm very knowledgeable about everything, and that was just our mutual choice um, because, 
you know, being over all the finances, which is not something I was, you know, all that excited and interesting about doing. And Perry was, you know, like, yeah, that's fine. I'd like to do that. Um, but I know what's going on. So, um, but, and if there's disagreements, um, we try to just, you know, rationally, logically discuss things. Um, no yelling and no, um, you know, bringing up other things. Um, and ultimately, I guess it just, I trust Perry. I mean, that's what it boils down to. I mean, he's earned my trust through our dating relationship and through our marriage. And, you know, I'll leave the ultimate decision up to him. But I definitely give him my input and... Um, there's not been a time that, you know, in the end, we haven't been mutually agreeable to whatever it was that we determined. Right. But it took us a little while to get there sometimes. <laughs> uh, real quick, how many married couples do we have here? Or if you're married, would you raise your hand? All right, look around, a lot of married people. All right, hands down. Second question, every campus. How many of the people that just raised their hand have ever argued about money? Would you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, everybody raised their hand. And the ones that didn't, how many of you struggle with lying? Uh, that, that would be... <laughs> You, you fight about that stuff. You fight about uh, the, the first argument we had, and I've told the story before, but um, it's when I went to, to balance the checkbook or look at the checkbook, and her haircut cost $75, um, and then she tipped $20, so it was a $95 haircut, and I was a, a smart aleck, and I was like, hey, baby, come in here for a minute. Um, what is this right here? And she's like, it's a haircut, and I'm like, oh, did you get an oil change as well? And, and did they rotate the tires and did that? I mean, what, like, what, what's up with a $95 haircut? And, you know, and I, I just didn't know. I think one of the things that um, couples, uh, one of the dangerous things is like you don't know what the other person has to spend on certain things. Like, seriously, I talk to single guys all the time. I'm like, do you know how much her underwear costs? Well, no. Well, see, you need to figure that out. Like, if you want her to wear Victoria's Secret stuff, they don't give that stuff away. Like, dude, you can buy underwear. You can, you can go to Walmart, pay $5 for your underwear, and you wear them until they dissolve. Like, literally, I, I mean, that happens. Uh, the, other th the other argument we had was the time I wanted to buy you the Mustang, and you told me no. And then there was one more. Oh, there yeah, you remember the, the motorcycle? I wanted to finish out our dishes because we didn't get, like, hardly any oh, of our dishes, yeah. and Perry wanted to motorcycle. And so the, the deal, it was kind of funny, was when we could afford to finish out the dishes that we were, and then so Perry wanted to get a motorcycle. And I was like, well, if you can afford to get a motorcycle, then can we not afford to finish out those dishes from several years ago that we, and he's like, oh yeah, okay. And then I said, if you can find the dishes, we'll finish them out. So we were in Texas. In Texas, I was speaking out there and we were in this mall and she walked into this shop and they had every, all of our dishes, like all of them. And, it, and she, for, for really, really cheap. For really, really, well, that's debatable. Um, but, but we bought every flipping dish in that store that I was like, oh my gosh. And so, so we finished out the dishes and now I can get a motorcycle. By the way, that's a rumor that I have one. It's a rumor. I've heard that I, I do not have a motorcycle, but it is a very high possibility that I will be getting one. Um, I know that freaks some of you out, but I have a sovereign God. I have a sovereign God, and you only have one shot at life. You might as well live it smiling instead of being scared of everything. I'm just, I'm just saying. And the one thing I would add to that is a budget is great. I mean, if you plan out ahead of time what your money's going to go to, then that eliminates so much argument and disagreement, you know, after the fact. Yeah, like I didn't even know what, I didn't know what makeup cost. I'm, I don't wear makeup. I don't, I don't wear it. So I remember right, we just sat down. I was like, that's what, that's what makeup costs? She's like, yep. I was like, all right, we'll pay it. <laughs> pay it. So anyway, we just, we talk about stuff. Next question. How should I handle my fifth grader who <laughs> feels like he has to have a girlfriend to be cool? Florence! What's up, Florence? We don't have these problems in Anderson. <laughs> That's a great question, Lucretia. Why don't you answer that one? Okay. Um, I guess um, my, my thought on the whole dating thing is before, I mean, the point of dating is to lead to marriage. So, you know, that's ultimately the reason that you date is I think I'm going to marry this person and we're going to pursue this relationship. 
And I think before you're going to pursue a relationship with another person, you have to have a relationship with Christ and you have to know who you are in Christ and, you know, what are your talents and abilities and who's God created you to be and what's that purpose and plan look like for your life. And I mean, you hear all these people say, oh, well, we just became two different people and just fell out of love and we just realized we didn't know each other. And I'm like, well, did you really know who you were even before you were with this person? Oh. Um, and I just think, too, if, if you want another person to love you for who you are, you've got to be yourself. And I think a lot of times, you know, even in middle school, kids are really still trying to figure that out. So I kind of don't even see the point of dating in middle school, to be honest. I mean, hmm. it's not like there's a set age because everybody's different as far as their emotional maturity, their spiritual maturity, where they are in Christ, and there's two people involved in that equation. Um, you know, and I would even say early high school, kind of what's the point? You know, pursue God, pursue you know, godly Christian relationships with girls and with guys, you know, um, have good, clean fun. Um, just learn about yourself, learn about the opposite sex, kind of figure all that out. And then at some point, you know, for me, it was college. It was my second year of college when Perry and I met. Um, and then it took a while for us to date and get married. Took but, a while. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I don't know. I, I really just see you know, especially a fifth grader, um, and even middle school, even early high school, that it's more of just a social, you know, hey, look at me, I have a girlfriend, more of a social status thing than, like, are you really going to, like, marry that person? And then you have all the baggage and the drama and, you know, all that emotional and all that effort and energy that went into this relationship that could have gone into just having some great, awesome friends or having, um, you know, a better relationship with Christ and growing in that area. Um, so, and honestly, just for everybody with kids, I mean, this is something that we talk to Karis about now, you know, it's like, whatever, Cinderella and Prince Charming, well, you know, Prince Charming was the guy that God brought in Karis's life, and, you know, one day, God will bring you this special, awesome guy um, for you to marry, and you're going to wait for that guy, and, you know, and Perry is, treats her awesome, and, you know, she's not going to settle for a guy that's any less awesome than her dad, and um, so just, I mean... <laughs> Really talking to kids early and kind of planting that seed early, um, you know, and it's never too late to start, but, you know, just having an honest conversation. If your children know you love them and they know that, you know, you're always telling them the truth and that you're honoring your word and what you tell them, then hopefully they'll listen, you know, and what's, you know, what, I don't know, what's the point? <laughs> That's just a lot of wasted energy and time and effort and heartache that's not really going to lead anywhere my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and you can't, I, I would say don't drive your kids from it. I mean, because if you, the more you tell them not to do something, <laughs> most of you figured out that they, they do that. But you, you just got to have an open conversation with your kids and talk to them about why do you want to date. Um, it, it's not a, you know, and it, it, please, oh my gosh, I, I know moms that their 13 year old girl will break up with a boy and the mom will cry because she's so devastated. And I'm like, she's 13. Um, they weren't going to get married anyway. And so, yeah, so that's what I would say. That's good, baby. I really just made all that up because I didn't have anything else to say because yours was so good. Okay. All right, next question. I turn my husband down a lot, even though we're active twice a week. What is active? I don't understand where you're going. Anyway, <laughs> what should I do if I am honestly too tired and flat out don't feel like it? <laughs> Baby, what should you do when you, I mean, when you feel tired? Because that's never happened to us. I mean. Well, um, I think, you know, one thing you've got to realize is there's two people involved in this relationship. And you want to respect each other's wishes and feelings. And you want to try to meet each other's needs. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of it's communication. I mean, if, mm. I mean, if it's a thing where, you know, look, this is the deal and, you know, your husband understands that it's real, that it's not an excuse, <laughs> it's not a rejection of him, it's, you know, that type of thing and being honest, but then, you know, the other side is, well, what's your husband going, been going through and, you know, if, if it's been longer, then, you know, that's kind of a different story. Um, if it's not been as long, you know, there's just a lot of factors involved. And I think just being open and honest about that. But then the other thing is get to the root of the too tired and flat out don't feel like it. I mean, most of the time, if there's intimacy 
emotional intimacy, you're spending time together, you're having fun together, you know, those type of things are going on, then, you know, most of the time women do have more energy and feel like it, even if they are more physically tired. So, I mean, sometimes getting to the root of what does that look like and how can, you know, what can you do as a couple to change that? I mean, is, are there things that you can do, you know, to, to change the too tired and don't feel like it um, before you even get in the bedroom? Because most things, you know, related to sex, really and truly, I would say at least 90, 95%, maybe even 99% is what's outside of the bedroom, and you bring that in the bedroom. So work on the things outside of the bedroom. And or the just, couch. Yes, or the couch. And just be open and honest and talk to each other. <laughs> Communication. <laughs> but you have the guy's perspective, so. I just, I mean, it just came into my mind, so I said it. The, the, the word I would focus on right there is honestly. If you're honestly too tired, then communicate to him that you're honestly too tired. Honestly. But the key word's honestly. Like, don't say you're too tired and he says, okay, then, then your best friend from college calls and you stay up and talk to her for the next hour and a half. Because then you weren't honest. You were a liar. Okay? Like, you, like don't do that. Um, Lucretia and I, honestly, I mean, she has been like, hey, I really am tired tonight, but after a good night's rest, how about tomorrow night? That, like, I, yeah. Praise God for that, man. I'm the next day. I'm, I'm, I'm like, Whoo, what's, what's going on with you? I'm good. Jesus is Lord. We're in a recession. I know. It's awesome, you know. And so it's, you know, give the guy a lot of energy the next day. But uh, yeah, communication. You got to communicate. I tell people all the time: read Song of Solomon. Um, I pointed this out in the first service. Song of Solomon. It's a great book um, for married couples to really read together. Um, if you're, oh, we're dating and we're reading the Song of Solomon. Yeah, um, go ahead and set up the counseling appointment. Song of Songs. Anytime you see beloved, um, that's the woman talking. Anytime you see lover, that's the man talking. They're having a conversation. Let me just say this is a conversation between two married people about sex and sexual intimacy. It is not an allegory about Christ and his church because Jesus is not asking the church to blow on his garden. That is sick. You obviously have never read the book, and if you have, you have never studied it in depth. This is a married man and a married woman, and they are talking about sex. When he says, I want to climb the palm tree and take a hold of the fruit, that's chapter 7, by the way. Uh, let me read that. Y'all don't think it says that. Hold on. <laughs> Chapter 7, verse 8, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of vine and the fragrance of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. Yeah. Like, where's Jesus in the church in that? Okay, Jesus is the... No, that's, that, that's the... Anyway, so you've got to talk. All this book is is a married couple talking about sex. Mm. All right. Next question. <laughs> That whole Jesus and the blow in the garden thing made everybody tense, didn't it? It did. This is my question. What are some practical ways to pursue purity? Anderson. Is this for me to answer? Oh, I, I think you should talk about this. This is good. Um, well, obviously the first thing is just pursue Christ and, you know, pray and spend time reading the Bible and having Christian friends that are going to hold you accountable, that are going to live godly lives. Um, you know, I know Perry's address from stage, you know, with women a lot of times is to dress modestly. Um, don't invite the unwanted kind of attention um, by the way you dress. Um, I know a lot of times just with our marriage, um, you know, well, with our dating was just being honest. And, I mean, in this kind of, I guess, for, for singles or for people who are early dating of just, um, you know, being honest about who you are with each other, being honest about, you know, what's going on. And, I mean, and I know this is a different sense of purity maybe than what someone was talking about, but, you know, if you're a guy, don't be holding a girl's hand and kissing her and you're not committed to dating her. Um, so even starting, you know, when you're friends of having purity in that friendship of is this a pure friendship? And then if you do go on to dating, you know, being pure in your dating relationship. Um, and then there were practically some things that I'll let you talk more about as far as we were dating. We knew we were getting married. We were not married yet. 
um, you know, kind of a different kind of purity, but it's got to start from the beginning. So it kind of starts from the beginning, hopefully, and continues throughout the relationship. So, Yeah, and I can, I can speak to dudes specifically right here. Uh, let me just say this, and this is for guys and girls. If you're pursuing Christ, you are pursuing purity. Right? You cannot pursue Jesus and pursue impurity at the same time. You, you can't. It's impossible. So if you're pursuing Christ, then you are pursuing purity. Saying that, every one of us, single or married, we're going to be tempted sexually. It's, it's going to be there, so you have to do whatever it takes to set up boundaries for you. Like, for example, when Lucretia and I started dating, it got to the point, like, the closer it got to the honeymoon, I remember telling, having the conversation with her, we cannot be alone anymore. We can't be alone. I, we just, we, we can't. And so literally about three months before we got married, we hung out with couples all the time. Other people, I mean, it was like, it was like we were in public. We, were, we just were not alone. Not, not, listen, I know me. I know me. I know where my mind, so I'm like, I'm, I'm going to set the boundary in place, and I'm, the boundary's there, and I was legalistic about it. So you've got to set up boundaries. I mean, and, and the, the boundaries have to come out of a pursuit of your heart for Christ. And then the other thing, as a, as a dude, we're commanded in the book of Timothy um, to, to treat girls as sisters. We're, I, I mean, we're, 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 we're commanded to treat them that way. So, I mean, like, like, so treat her as your sister in Christ. I mean, you're going to go make out with your sister like that? Probably not. Ugh. <laughs> so anyway. I would say, I would say um, pursue Christ is actually the way to pursue purity. That's the, I mean, that's the best thing I could, I could offer there. Anyway, next question. Wow! <laughs> hey, look at that! <laughs> that's a good one, guys! That is awesome! Okay, I didn't know this one was, uh, didn't know this one was going to be there, so let's just address it. I'm, I'm, You're the guy, so maybe you should answer Well, I mean, girls do it too, but I mean, I mean I'm, I'm going to address this question. Okay. I don't want your emails. This question was asked, and I'm going to answer it because I'm not scared of it. Are you ready? You can't masturbate without lusting. You can't. You can't. You can't masturbate and sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> That's going to be on YouTube. <laughs> you can't. Now, can we all agree that lust is a sin? I would say to the person who asked this question, I'm glad you, you texted this question in. You, you have a self-control issue, which is actually tied into the Holy Spirit. Because one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and 23 is self-control. And so you, you have a self-control issue. I mean, masturbation is a sin because you can't masturbate without lusting. And if you see, if you walk into a room and you see someone masturbating, you don't think, wow, that person knows Jesus. <laughs> Do you? I mean, wow, look, look at that. person knows Christ. Ah! I mean, they're like, perfect. I'm like, what's going on? So I, I would say masturbation, um, keeping you from sleeping around, um, it's actually probably not because if you masturbate regularly, then if you had the chance to sleep around, you would. It's not a masturbation issue. It's a self-control issue, which, which is actually a Holy Spirit issue. So I would get to the root of that instead of just trying to stop something that you perceive as bad. Or obviously you don't perceive it's bad because you think it's okay. Uh, so, so, so the question I would ask you, is it okay for me to just knock the pee out of people because it keeps me from killing them? Like if any time, just bam, just punch them right in the nose. Well, I didn't, it keeps me from killing them. <laughs> so it's, uh, you, would you say anything there? Um, I would just probably add that God created sex between man and woman, and he brought Adam and Eve in the garden together, and they were one flesh. Um, and so that's really something that's designed between husband and wife to be very special. 
and God created that intimacy and those physical feelings are supposed to be associated with your spouse and with um, that intimacy and that um, pleasure, mutual pleasure together. And so I think whether this person is single or married, they're taking away from the relationship with their current spouse or their future spouse mm. by experiencing this outside of marriage. That's good. Signing a prenup agreement inviting a marriage failure, Florence. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, you are planning for your divorce, which is kind of sad. Um, I mean, we went into marriage... 100% sure that God has called us to be married, that he brought us together, and um, we don't mention the word divorce. We don't joke about the word divorce. That's just not an option. Um, God brought us together, and we're committed to each other, and we love each other, and sometimes things are easy, and sometimes things are hard, but, you know, we're together, and we're going to make this work, and, um, you know, what? And, and it truly is. You know, the Bible says I mean, God modeled marriage, and he brought Adam and Eve together, and he joined them together, and he said that they were one flesh, and, you know, it's kind of hard to, to be one together if you're separating, this is yours, and this is mine, and, okay, and now we're going to plan our divorce, and when we get divorced, this is going to be yours, and this is going to be mine. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, you know, it, to me, I just wonder about the heart. I mean, you know, and I know what society, and I know what culture says, and it just seems like it's more of a, a mindset of the world and what's going on now in the times than a mindset and a heart of what Christ would want for that relationship. Yeah, when you divide the assets before you get married, that's a problem. I w I'll say this, and I really came to grips with this about a year or two ago. I personally will not perform a wedding ceremony if a prenuptial agreement is involved. I will not do it. And that is a conviction that I personally came to. I just... I'm not going to marry a couple that's already planned the divorce. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And, uh, and you know, I, and I really pray. I don't, I don't enforce that across the board for all the pastors at New Spring Church, but I would almost bet you that most of them um, agree with that same thing. Because, but I, so I would just say if you're planning your divorce before your marriage, then you really need to investigate your heart as to whether or not you truly trust the person that you're going to marry in the first place. What is your view on homosexuality? It's a great question. Glad somebody asked. Nobody had the guts to ask it in the first service. Here, here's the problem with the church. Let, let me kind of give a twofold answer to this because this is, a, this is a hot button. This is even hotter than the racism issue right now. Um, a lot of people think the church in America today, that um, especially the evangelical church, which I would categorize us as an evangelical church, just not weird evangelical is that we hate beer, gays, and sex. Seriously, I mean, it's like, and you're all conservative Republicans and da 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 And so there's this weird perception out there that the church hates homosexuals. And it, it's, just, it's just not true. Um, we don't hate homosexuals. I don't hate homosexuals. Um, and this is coming from a man who was molested twice as a boy by men. And so I know what I'm talking about here. I don't hate homosexuals, but homosexuality, according to the scriptures, is a sin. It's a sexual sin that God names in many places, but he puts it in the same category, same category with perverse people and people that are doing, sleeping together and they're not married. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's in the same category of sexual sin. And so I would say that my view on homosexuality is the biblical view on sexuality, that, it, that it, it is a sin before God, and it's not right. And it's something that should be repented of and dealt with, just like somebody who's having sex with somebody they're not married to, that sin should be repented of and dealt with. I think the reason the church loves to look down on homosexuality is because that's the sin that we don't commit, and so we can judge that while we're going out and having sex with a bunch of people we're not married to. And I think you've got to put sexual sin in the category of sexual sin. Homosexuality is in the category of sexual sin. And God says it's wrong. And so because God says it's wrong, 
I'm not judging you by telling you that the Bible says it's wrong. Therefore, the church's stance on homosexuality is that it's a sin that should be repented of. But if you are a homosexual attending whatever campus that you're at, I'm glad you're here and you're always welcome to walk in the doors of, these, of this church. And if you want to join the church, we will talk to you about the condition of where you are sexually in regards to homosexuality, but you're always welcome to walk into the doors of New Spring Church no matter where it is. And I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. So that's our view. Um, really nothing to add. I guess I'd just say from, you know, the medical viewpoint being a doctor and, you know, the anatomy, physiology of how God designed our bodies is, you know, goes along with what God says is, you know, that's, that's sin, that's wrong, and, and our bodies aren't made to work that way. <laughs> yeah, but on the flip side, I don't, I don't hate, I don't hate people that are gay. I have a lot of friends that are pastors. We don't sit around and, and bash, we just don't do that. I mean, that's not my heart. I, I, and, and and I know there are some churches that do that. And, oh, and, and I, like, I talk about them way more than I talk about you. I mean, that, that just makes me mad. So, anyway. Next question. Lucretia, do you ever find it hard to let him have control? Not the remote control, but the control. What if you think he's making a wrong decision? That is a great question, baby. It is a good question. Um, Okay, um, I think honestly to, to answer the question would even back up to when we were dating um, and you know before we started dating was really like okay you know this is a great godly guy and uh, you know the, the question from last week about the immeasurably more than all you can ask and imagine the big long huge question. Um, that was just something that God had showed me in my heart that, you know, that's what I wanted. And so I felt like, you know, Perry was that kind of guy and through a lot of prayer and, you know, God wanted us to be together as a couple. And in our dating relationship, there was a lot of trust that was earned and it was truly earned. Um, God worked in my heart a lot and trust was an issue, you know, from growing up that I dealt with. I didn't trust people very easily. And so Perry earned my trust and... Um, that obviously carries over into the marriage. And so when there are issues that we disagree with, I mean, we talk about them. You know, I tell him my point of view. We try to stick to the point and be very logical, rational, no yelling, um, and talk about things and pray about things. And I know that he loves me, and I know that he wants the best for me, that he's not looking out for his best interest and he's not just, I want to be right or I want to get my way. And so um, when we talk about things, discuss about things, whatever, in the end, if we don't agree, um, ultimately, I support his decision. Um, I feel like the Bible, you know, shows us that the male, the male is the leader in the relationship. Um, but that also falls under that he loves his wife as Christ loves the church, that, you know, we're all in submission to God. Um, so I totally don't have a problem with knowing that one day he's going to be held accountable for his decisions. And, you know, the, the whole deal with Adam and Eve, you know, Adam's ultimately the one who sinned. She's the one who ate the fruit that God said, do not eat. And then God comes looking for him in the garden. And he said, Adam, where are you? Because Adam was there the whole time and didn't do anything. Um, so Adam was held accountable for that. And um, so I, I believe that, but that's because he's earned my trust. I mean, that's not because... Okay, that's what the verse says, so I guess I just have to let him make the decision. It's that I truly know that he's going to do what's best and what's right. And I really don't think we've ever had something where we disagreed that in the end we didn't come to an agreement. Right. So. Because I was wrong, and then she <laughs> shared her opinion, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so then we agreed that she was right. But I know he's listening to God. So it's pretty so. easy. I listen to God and Lucretia, and that helps me make, <laughs> make a lot of really good decisions. <laughs> Next question. What to do if your spouse doesn't know Jesus, what do I do? Um, you know, I've already, I've already alluded to this verse. Let me, let me just read this to you. Um, 
more than likely, this is a, a woman that asked this question, though it, it could be a man. Um, scripture says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, which does not be, mean a doormat. It just means, you know, acknowledging the, the, the relationship. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So if you have a spouse that does not know Christ, here's the thing I know. The very fact that you ask this question, um, you're burdened for him or you're burdened for her. And, and I think I see that. I, I feel that. I know what that's like. There's a lot of people here that you probably have a spouse that does not know Jesus. Maybe you're sitting with your spouse that does not know Jesus. I would say it, continue to pray for them. Seek God. Like I said last week, Ecclesiastes 3.11. He makes everything beautiful in his time, not our time. You keep praying for them. I know people that have prayed for people for 50 years and then they come to Christ. So I would tell you, don't be the Holy Spirit in their lives. Let Jesus work on their heart. Pray for Jesus to work on their heart. Pray for Jesus to work on your heart and show you how you can model Jesus for them because sooner or later they're going to ask you a question about your faith. So that's what I would say. Well, I mean, is it? Um, yeah, all that. And the only thing I would add because I've kind of seen this happen before is when and if God does get that person's attention and they become a Christian, that you really got to rejoice with that and try to realize that they're a new creation in Christ and not um, continue to hold bitterness for the things of the past mm. when they weren't That's good. that Christian and they weren't you know, the man or woman that you wish they were or, or whatever and, and issues that might have been in the marriage when they weren't a Christian is, you know, it's just really hard sometimes to let those go and to try to move forward with both people being a Christian now in the marriage. So that's, I think that's just an important thing, you know, when, when that prayer is finally answered, to rejoice and move forward and not to live in the past because that person is not the same person anymore because Christ has changed them. Yeah. Let me speak to that before I do. Who, the guys that are moderating the questions, we've got time for two more. So get the last two ready, the two that you feel need to pop up on the screen. And let me kind of allude to that. We had some friends that um, the guy didn't know Christ and the woman knew, knew Christ and she prayed forever and ever for her husband to become a Christian. So her husband became a Christian and then he began to take the lead in the relationship and try to do what Jesus called him to do and she got bitter and it was really weird. So, yeah. Two, so two more questions. Is it okay to date a guy who drinks and cusses if you know he's a good guy who just needs some guidance? Well, it depends on what he drinks. Um, I, 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 you want me to take over? Well, Jeff, I mean, wanna... yeah. <laughs> okay, um, well, uh, back to the... <laughs> I guess what I mentioned. I'm, no, I'm glad they answered this. I, I, I'm glad they asked this question. Previously, is kind of you know what is the point of dating? Is you know you're hoping, assuming this is possibly going to lead to marriage, um, and then I think if you're looking at getting married, you're looking at is this God's best for me? And you know I would just say that if a person is cussing and drinking and a good guy. <laughs> Um, and needs some guidance. I'm not sure that that person is a man of God who's totally in love with Jesus and pursuing Jesus and going to be the leader in that relationship and be able to love you like Christ loves the church. Um, and kind of, as we mentioned previously, that when you marry somebody, you're marrying them as is. You know, if, if things change, if there's some things that, you know, you're not thrilled with and those aspects change after the marriage, well, great. Um, but there's no guarantee. So you need to realize that you're marrying the person as is and you're um, not the Holy Spirit and that's who changes people. And so um, your little guidance a lot of times comes in the form of nagging and you know, this is who I am, why are you trying to change me type thing. So you're not the Holy Spirit, and you do not want to settle for less than God's best. So it kind of sounds like you're trying to justify this is not God's best, but maybe if I work on the person a little bit, they can become God's best. And um, that never works that way. Yeah, I, I would just say thank you for asking the question, but the very 
is it okay? Um, first of all, you know it's not okay. Um, one of the problems that we have many times as Christians is we try to justify our behavior that we know is wrong. Uh, when we just confess and repent of it, when God convicts us of it, we'd, we'd do a lot better. Um, is it okay to date a guy who drinks and cusses? Okay, you've identified this guy as a drinker and a cusser and not a man of God who might have a drink and say a swear word. There's, there's a difference. There, there, there's a huge difference. And so the way you've identified him tells me that you, I mean, that's the way you, I, I didn't ask the question. I'm just saying this is the way you identified him. Um, and you know he's a good guy who just needs some guidance. Well, the problem is he's depending on you for guidance and not the Holy Spirit, and he needs to learn how to listen to the voice of God. So the answer to, to your question, I, I would say, is um, you, you know the answer to your question. Uh, if you've got to fix him up, um, then you might need to back off and let Jesus fix him up. Jesus can do a much better job than you. I, pr- I promise. I mean, it's incredible. All right, last question, and this is it. How do y'all, love that, how do y'all deal with conflict and misunderstanding in y'all's relationship? Well, shoot fire! <laughs> and this is from Columbia. Oh my gosh. Example, having different expectations for each other, etc. How do y'all deal with that? <laughs> Lots of communication. Um, I mean, you really just have to be open and honest with each other and talk about things. Um, I, I would even say the little things. I mean, if there's something that's not even that big of a deal and it bothered me a little bit, I'll still tell Perry. I'll say, you know, look, I'm bringing this up. It's not a big deal, but, you know, it is a little deal, and I just want to tell you about it, and we talk about it, and it's over and done with. And, and if you don't, then the next time there's an issue and the next time there's an issue and then you really, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back and then you're bringing up this issue and then you're bringing up all these past issues. And so we really just try to keep short accounts and deal with the issue at hand. And, um, you know, we are, we are, we're um, a married couple. And so, you know, God has brought the two of us together to be one. And if I'm tearing him down or hurting him or just trying to win the argument, I'm hurting us as a couple and I'm tearing us down and really trying to work through issues and have the best for our marriage, not to get what I want or to be right or to win the argument. Um, and then the having different expectations, I mean, you just got to talk about that. And sometimes you may have real unrealistic expectations um, that, the, you know, that that person's never going to be that way. And other times they're just unspoken. You know, the person's like, I would be glad to do that. I just didn't know um, that it mattered. And um, I think Perry's mentioned our bed, making the bed issue. And I was like, well, I'd love to make the bed for you. I didn't know it was important to you. Sure, no problem. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the thing is, don't ever assume that your spouse just said the worst thing to you. Always ask for clarification. Uh, because many times... Uh, we, we will we'll assume that, and you can't. Uh, the other thing is, I'm very legalistic about Ephesians 4, where it says, do not let the sun go down while you're angry. I've never gone to bed mad at Lucretia, ever, in 10 years of marriage, just about. Um, now, we've stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning talking, but we don't go to bed mad, because I don't want that seed of bitterness to build in my heart as a husband, and then one day I just lower the flipping boom on my wife. The other thing is timing, when to talk about these things. Like, if she's got to confront me on something, she doesn't do it on (laughs) Sunday after I've preached three services and walk in the door. Glad you're here. Let me tell you the reasons I'm mad at you right now. I mean, that, you got to, I mean, with with both, you got to take the timing thing. But we, uh, seriously, 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 we don't let the sun go down on us while we're angry. Um, And my job as a husband is to talk to her like Christ loves the church. You don't see Jesus anywhere in Scripture yelling and beating up his church. He gently woos his church back to him, and that is my job as a husband, is to gently pull her back to me, even in the context of conflict. I've been talking to a guy for almost seven months now, and we are still not dating, but I am ready to date, but I am not sure what to do nor say. Go for it, baby. (laughs) Well, um... I, I don't know. I guess, you know, definitely interested as far as what's been talked about in the relationship. So if you've been um, talking to the guy for seven months, is he actually pursuing you? Or, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I would love more information. But um, 
I mean, there's definitely a point where you need to decide, okay, this is going on to a relationship or we're just going to be friends and this is all this is ever going to be because you can't both people be emotionally involved or invested in this relationship. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if the guy's not taking any lead there, I mean, is he wanting to further this relationship? Maybe not. Maybe that's why he hasn't. Is he talking to lots of other girls or... I don't know, maybe he needs a little encouragement, and Perry's mentioned a couple of encouraging lines that you could give for a guy to let him know you're interested. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the term DTR? DTR, <laughs> the, define the relationship. That's what that, that means. Um, maybe you need to have a DTR because there's, two, there's a couple possibilities here. Maybe he's um, not really interested in you. He's just talking to you to be your friend. And I, I don't want to be hardcore, but maybe, well, I don't know. Um, and, and maybe you're reading something into it, and so you, it's not wrong to ask. It is wrong to get all emotional on the guy. <laughs> Are we good, dude? Don't do that. Um, that's evil, so, so stop it. But, um, and if he is interested and he's not taking the lead, <laughs> you should just back off and let him take the lead. Uh, seriously, you should back off and let him take the lead. Because if he's not going to take the lead in pursuing you, then he's not going to take the lead in the marriage, and, and you, don't, you don't really want that guy. Like, you, you don't want him. You don't want him. He's a, he'll be a couch potato. <laughs> he is now. Cool. Awesome. Next question. I've had a plan without a man, but men seem to be intimidated by that and my success. Should I do something else? Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to be quick to listen. Why don't you go first? Okay. I actually like this question. Um, I think that this is obviously a special person, and hopefully they will have great success with relationships also because if you're intimidating the guys because you're successful and you have a plan and you're confident, then that means you're going to have to also have a successful, confident guy that's going to be man enough to ask you out. Dang. So a lot, of, a lot of the guys that you wouldn't want to go out with anyway, they're not going to ask you out. So mm. you, like, have less people to weed through. Um, so I would say, do you need to do something else? No. Um, you need to be the person that God's called you to be, the person that God's created you to be. That's good. And you just need to continue to follow God and, and be open to when he does have that great guy to come along. And if he's going to be the leader in the relationship and love you like Christ loves the church, then he's going to have to be man enough and secure enough to ask you out in the first place. So you just have a set up for lots of success. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all give her a hand. That was good. I, I would say that men are intimidated. Uh, and you, if you were here a few weeks ago when I talked about the marbles and things, we started to hand the guys the marbles and stuff, uh, that, that's their problem. That's their problem. If you are successful and you are a woman, you don't ever lower your standards because you intimidate a boy. Ever. Oh my gosh. You have a plan. You're successful. You have dreams and you don't need him to come in and rescue you. That, that is intimidating. You're talking to the guy that married a doctor. Okay? Doctor. She was intimidating. Um, but I, I wore her down. It's awesome. <laughs> with God's help. So yeah, with God's help, <laughs> by His grace. No, so no, don't do something else. Listen, listen, girl, don't you dare do anything else. You continue to pursue Jesus. You continue to allow Him bl to bless you with success. And, and if that intimidates a guy away, that's God's favor on you, intimidating guys away from you that you don't even need to be with in the first place. So that's what I would say. Next, what does God think of interracial relationships? Okay, well, here we go. You can answer this. this is, one. Yeah, this is, this is where somebody walked out in the first service. Let me, let me just break this down so everybody can understand it very quickly. In the South, when you say interracial, you don't mean interracial, you mean black and white. Because most people in the South don't actually have a problem with interracial relationships. If you bring home someone of Asian descent, if you bring home someone of um, Hispanic descent, it's not a big problem. It's black and white. And the reason people in the South 
have a problem with black and white is there's a sin called racism that we have not repented of yet. And it's, it, at, at best, at best, it's extreme stupidity. And don't send me your verses, because we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, don't send me your verses on God said not to mix the tribes. Okay, yeah, interracial dating is not what he meant, you moron. Now, I'm fired up about this. That's not what he meant. He was talking about mixing with people that do not know God, who do not know Jesus. Had nothing to do with interracial dating. This is a hot button of mine. I do not care. I said this a few weeks ago, and I got a response, and it ticked me off. It was like, you won't say this when she's 18. Listen, I do not care what color the man is that my little girl marries. Here's what I care about. Does he love the Lord his God with all his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength? Is he living out Matthew 6, which says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. As a father and as a mother, that is what matters to us as parents. If he loves Jesus, I don't care if he's purple, I don't care if he's pink, I don't care if it's a smurf, I don't care what it is. I don't care what color the man is, if He loves Jesus. And to think that you're better than somebody because of your color, which you didn't choose, by the way, is just arrogance and stupidity at best. 